Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to lesson two of our unit on Chinese government and the dynasty system. Today's essential question is, what were the Tang and Song dynasties like? And before we do anything, we always review essential vocabulary. And today's four essential terms are a repeat of our four terms from the first lesson. The first one is political. Anytime we see the word political, it means having to do with the government. If it has to do with the government, it's political. We also have dynasties. A dynasty is ruled by a single family, uh, and that can occur over a long period of time. So, for example, North Korea is ruled by the Kim dynasty at present. There is also the aristocracy. If we talk about aristocrats, we're talking about very wealthy people who have special privileges in society. And then today we're also going to talk about a meritocracy, which is where you are ruled by people who have actually proved that they have the qualifications and the temperament to have power in society. A meritocracy based on merit. Our first left side question today is why was the Tang Dynasty important? And please note at the bottom of the slide, it says that the Tang Dynasty ruled from 618 to 907 in the Common Era. Uh, the Tang Dynasty relied on a large bureaucracy, which is a vocabulary word, and built large public works projects. So the Tang Dynasty was a building dynasty. They built roads, they built bridges, they built things that made cities operate effectively, and that's one of the ways you keep the people happy, is by building things that they need. Before the Tang Dynasty came along, pretty much if you wanted a job in government, you needed to be a wealthy aristocrat, and they were the people who helped to run the government. And there was also something called nepotism that was also common. And nepotism is when you give all the best jobs to your family and friends because you trust them. Not because of what they've proven they can or cannot do. It's just you know them, so you give them a job. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that doesn't always work out so well. Uh, the Tang Dynasty started what was known as civil service examinations. And since you've already taken your vocabulary test, you know what that is. If you're going to be in the civil service, you have to prove that you belong there. And so you had to pass a test. And if you didn't pass the test, you couldn't get a government job. So at the very least, this helped people prove that they were actually worthy of leadership. And in order to pass these tests, you had to study the works of Confucius, a very famous ancient Chinese philosopher. In fact, we might have a Confucius day where we talk about the teachings of Confucius. Uh, you had to read the classics, in other words, all the classic books uh, that, that existed in China. You had to have some background in law and how Chinese law operated. And you had to have some background in poetry. So you basically had to be a well-rounded person uh, in what we would now call the liberal arts. The problem here is even though this exam system sounds like a great idea, in order to get the education you needed to pass these exams, you pretty much had to have money or privileges in society because the average person couldn't afford to get that kind of education and was spending most of their time busy trying to make life work rather than to edify themselves through education. So this still was a system that favored the wealthy. Uh, eventually, the Tang Dynasty was taken down by peasant rebellions because the peasants still realized, hey, even though we got this great exam system, we still have no way into it because we're not educated enough to pass these exams. And just like the end of the previous dynasty, uh, warlords who controlled different parts of China from a military perspective started to fight with each other outside the control of the emperor, and therefore the power of the emperor ebbed away and the dynasty collapsed and China fell into warlordism for a significant period of time. How long a period of time? 
You'll find out on the next slide. We know that the Tang Dynasty ended in 907 in the Common Era, otherwise known as AD. And that lasted until 960, so 53 years of warlordism uh, and chaos uh, until China came under the next dynasty known as the Song. And I've got a cool little graphic there at the bottom that tells you the things the Song was known for. Um, the things in those green boxes I don't necessarily expect you to write in your notes, but they are extremely interesting. And if you wanted to add them to your notes, that would be super cool. Uh, the Song Dynasty opened up the civil service examination to far more candidates. So they realized, you know what? Even though we've got these civil service exams, people aren't exactly educated enough to take them. So we're going to try and make it possible for more people to take those exams so that more people in society feel they have a stake uh, in the society itself. Uh, they based it on meritocracy. They really wanted those people who deserved jobs to get those jobs. So this was an attempt to get rid of nepotism and to put the aristocracy in its place. Um, these exams were based on Neo-Confucianism. Time has passed here, so they still follow the teachings of Confucius, but they were also influenced by what's known as Taoism and Buddhism. Uh, at this point, Buddhism was a major belief system that was influencing China, uh, and it had a significant influence upon the Song Dynasty. Um, all of these things together were known as the Four Books. So the Four Books focused on Confucianism, Taoism, Buddhism, and a mysterious fourth book that's not mentioned. Uh, one of the main teachings of Confucianism was about knowing your place. Um, most of the relationships were between those who were superior and those who were inferior. So for, exa for example, the teacher and the student, the general and the soldier, the government official and the citizen. Uh, the only relationship that was not um, superior, inferior was friend to friend because friends meet each other on equal footing. Um, the basic philosophy be behind Confucianism is those above should be kind to those below, and those below should respect and obey those above. So if you're a parent, you are in the superior position, but you have an obligation to be kind to those below you, your children. Uh, if you are a child, uh, you should respect and obey those above you, your parents, but they should also be acting out of kindness. So if you know your role and they know their role, uh, society will flow harmoniously according to Confucius. Um, here in America, we're a little bit more independent than that, although when you read those phrases, you kind of think to yourself, you yeah, know, that kind of makes sense. Maybe they had something there. Uh, people from the lower classes were therefore able to rise in the new system under the Song Dynasty because they did try to put a meritocracy into place. So you know, from the point of social progress, you could say the ball was moving forward. And at the end of three years under this system, officials could move up in rank. So not only did you have to pass the test in the first place, but then, once you got the job, you had to be in that job for three years before you move up to the next job. So, interesting. Very interesting. There are, there are a lot worse systems than this, ladies and gentlemen. So maybe the Song Dynasty had something. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, these are the two dynasties we're studying in this lesson. Uh, this would be a brilliant time to perhaps write that summary at the bottom of your Cornell notes putting into your own words the most important things that we've learned about these two dynasties today. And in the meantime, this is Mr. Blumenthal signing off from Lesson 2 on Ancient Chinese Government. We'll be back with Lesson 3 coming soon to a classroom near you.